Welcome back to Season 3 of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice, but if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season has been focused on interviewing people who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. If that sounds like you, reach out. We can talk about having you on the show, too. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can also show support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal. You can find the links to either option in the podcast description. As always, a portion of the proceeds do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. Uh, today, with I have with me a repeat guest, which a lot of you are going to recognize. That doesn't happen very often. But back when I first talked to this guest, I knew that what she was onto was something big. This author has gone leaps and bounds since that day, and I cannot wait to have them tell you their story about how this has gone for them. Mason Carlisle is an American activist, a poet, an author, a photographer, and a columnist. They've dedicated their life to removing the stigma that surrounds mental illness, school shootings, and suicide, which are all topics that we have discussed previously. Um, But she also covers other topics affecting society, too. I'm going to have her tell you a little bit more about it because she's going to do a better job than I will any day of the week. Welcome to the show, Mason. Hi, that was an amazing introduction. Honestly, I think you covered it (laughs) better than I could have. Um... (laughs) Well, and I I should say, rather than welcome to the show, Mason, I should say welcome back to the show. Yeah, welcome back. You and I originally talked last September was when you were on the show previously. Yep. And this was one of, I want to say, one of the first 10 episodes I ever did with um, other authors where I was interviewing people on my podcast. Up until then, it had just been me on whatever rambles I was on. (laughs) Still entertaining. (laughs) <laughs> thank you uh, but yeah you were one of my very first people that I had on the podcast and I knew that what you were doing was super important you had at the time just written and released a book called the ghost of you yes that one is as soon as I learned what the book was about it tugged at my heartstrings uh specifically because of my own experiences growing up as a a severely bullied kid in school. Um, Instantly, I could hear bits of my own experiences in what I was learning about your book, and it was just heartbreaking. And I knew you were on to something big, but since then, you've gone on to do more writing, and you've come out with, what is this new book? Uh, The new book is called Deterrent. It is the direct sequel to The Ghost of You, but it's a new point of view. The narration has changed to Adrian O'Connor, the fan favorite from book one. Oh, wow. And how is this one a a completely different perspective? What are the differences between these two characters? Oh, man. Uh, They're actually written to be kind of parallels of each other in a way. Um, Levi, in the first book, we saw that he's very, um, implosive with his feelings. Like, he kind of takes it out on himself more than other characters might. He kind of internalizes a lot of his struggles. Um, Adrian is a more (sighs) impulsive, um, outburst kind of character. He shows his feelings very outwardly. Um, minor spoiler alert, but he's actually a psychologist, so he cares a lot more about, like, looking at the signs of other people, and he pays attention more than Levi ever did, and he's got very severe ADHD, and it shows. Wow. Very different book. And, uh, he's seven, they're seven years older. There's a seven-year time jump. Oh, wow. Very cool. Does it explore... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a car passed. Oh, <laughs> uh, does it explore why this character decided to become a psychologist? Psychiatrist? Yes. Psychiatrist yes, it or does. psychologist? Um, at this point, psychologist. Um, he okay. 
it's minor spoiler again. He has just received his Bachelor of Psychology about a week before the book starts. Oh, very cool. Nice. I, I have noticed, specifically in the fields of, of mind work, a lot of those people go into those fields because they've experienced traumatic uh, experiences of their own. I imagine there's probably a connection there for this character, huh? Absolutely. Um, it definitely gets explained. Um, he goes pretty in depth with it and all the reasons, even the reasons he wants to go into the specific fields that he chooses for his majors. That's pretty cool. So, and I've noticed the same thing with authors. Yeah. Uh, when I talk to people on my podcast, when they've oh. written about a, any kind of uh, traumatic experiences, it's because they've typically experienced something of their own. Absolutely. Uh, and we've touched base on this in the previous episode, but can you refresh us a little bit, just kind of with an overview? Um, I know you're a trauma survivor of your own. What kind of traumas have you had to experience? Um, I don't want to get too heavily into much about my childhood currently, but um, I did have definitely a rough childhood. I experienced the aftermath of both um, an attempt at a pretty young age, 12, not mine, but someone very close in my family. And uh, since I was 17, I've lost quite a few people to suicide itself that weren't just attempts. So seeing this repeated over and over in my life, um, and just the most recent one being just like a couple months ago, is... Yeah, it's just something that just keeps happening in my generation. And it it needs to be talked about because there's so much stigma to remain silent about these topics. And that's half of where the problem is coming from. So seeing a lot of that growing up and seeing a lot of um, the effects of addiction, like I didn't get raised by my father, but I grew up knowing that my father didn't have me because he was an addict. And unfortunately, he did overdose before I got to know him as an adult. So seeing all these different issues, losing someone to drunk driving, losing someone to cancer, losing someone to all these different things has really affected my life. And I don't think people really understand grief enough without seeing it. Right. I agree. Uh, And without experiencing it. I've known people that have have you know, minor grief in their lives and they're of the mindset that things just get better with time and they don't, they don't. No, they don't. Um, yeah. I talked to a well-known actress from the walking dead several years ago when I oh, told wow. her about my own experience and uh, you know, what I'd been through. She told me, she said, I want to sign something for you, but I'm going to write it uh, very, um, very personally. And what she wrote was actually a line that she said on the TV show, The Walking Dead. um, The pain never really goes away. We just make room for it. Yeah. And that's so true. And there's so many false stigmas about what it means to um, have suicide in your life, whether it's ideation, whether it's having experienced it for somebody else has gone through it, whether it's attempts of your own, there, there's so much false information. And it's this way with pretty much everything out there. Um, there's mental illnesses, there's human trafficking, there's suicide, there's all of this stuff. And One of the biggest problems that I see with it is that people say, well, if you're going to talk about it, that means you're just looking for attention. You're not actually going to do it. And that's not true. Um, I think that there's a lot of negative connotations surrounding the word attention in the first place that really shouldn't be there. Because when you think about it, you're looking at a person that's doing something that you find so counterproductive to their health and safety that you're at least subconsciously worried for them. And your first instinct is to judge them for needing that help instead of just being there. Like it doesn't take a lot to be there for your fellow human being. And there's nothing wrong with someone needing attention because human beings genuinely need connection with other human beings to be okay. I think that we've stigmatized attention and needing to be social to the point that it's just compounding the issue with the suicide epidemic at this point. Right. 
we're social cre- creatures. We are hardwired to be social creatures. We need that sense of community. Exactly. Yeah. And everyone feels like everyone needs to feel like someone's paying attention to them. All we right. do yeah. in our daily lives is pay attention to things. And all that's telling people is that they're not worth your time and attention. Right. Yeah. But that's not helping. Yeah. So how do we get more people to open up about it? How do we talk about this more openly? <sighs> that's a hard one. Yeah. Um, I think removing the stigma on therapy is a really good start. Um, yeah. A lot of people, you hear, the, like, I'm in therapy, and it's like, oh, no. And it's, I think everyone would benefit from therapy. <laughs> I tell people all the time I've never met a therapist that didn't have a therapist. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Psychologists need therapists. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's this, again, the sense of community, the sense of feeling like you're not alone, the, fe- the sense that you're not carrying this heavy burden all by yourself. Exactly. You know? and, and I'm I thankful think... that I have a great support system with that and a great therapist with that. But I think that's where it starts is making yeah. sure you have a solid support system. Um, and it doesn't have to be family. It can be found family. It can be friends. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly the kind of boat that I'm in. I have created the family that I needed because I didn't have the family I needed. And it's not impossible to do that even coming from um, a a very scary kind of background. It's important to understand healthy boundaries and to have some healthy boundaries in place before you start deciding that these are the people you're going to be sharing every bit of your life with, but it's not impossible. No, absolutely not. Tell me a little bit about your masks. I know your masks are (laughs) kind of on Rorschach test. You create these yourself, right? I do. How did I you do. start doing this? Oh, man. <laughs> so <laughs> this is an interesting story. It kind of involves my former publisher. Um, another update for the book is that I dropped my publisher and I'm self-publishing now, just going full indie. But one of the reasons was because they kept asking me to use like an author picture Um I I really didn't like the picture they had access to, and they had it on accident. But they asked, like, 14 times. This one man asked me 14 times to use, like, this specific picture. And it was before I came out, and I didn't want to do that. So finally, I'm like, I don't want to show my face. I wanted to publish this book anonymously, and my friends and family talked me out of that. Like, I don't want to be recognizable in public. I don't want any of that. I just want my security and I want to do something that matters and not just be the face of this. I want to make it bigger than that. And there's a lot of reasons for that too. There was a shooting that came, that happened (laughs) right around the same time that your book came out. And there were a lot of similarities. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of similarities. All of them are unintentional. Um, I did a lot of research on school shootings before I wrote The Ghost of You or Deterrent that has more similarities to a Nashville tragedy. Um, But I did so much research and efforts to make sure that it didn't feel like any other shooting that has happened because I thought that would be so disrespectful. And then Uvalde happened like a week after the release of The Ghost of You with the same number of casualties, the same gun, same motive. Like, Ugh. it was alarmingly close. I really almost pulled the book. Yeah, um, I but that's that. another reason that the masks come into play. Um, I know with the things that I talk about that it's eventually going to get <laughs> dicey at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I decided that I could blend the psychology of what I talk about into kind of the face of my brand, I guess you could put it. Um, And I ended up making an ink blot test with just some paint, folded up paper, and then I slapped that wet paint on a mask and I'm like, oh my god, that's awesome, but what if this is the most insane, stupid idea I've ever had in my life? What if everyone hates it? What if this is super stupid? And then I'm like, I'm having an anxiety attack. So I named it Anxiety, I themed it after Anxiety, and that was the first of like 30-something masks at this point that 
I use regularly for videos and now sell on Etsy. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, I have yeah, like 15 commissions. Oh my gosh. I know. I love that you decided to go forward with it, even through your own fears. I mean, if that's not the definition of courage, I don't know what is. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I would never consider myself to be a courageous human. Um, <laughs> I definitely would. And most people who are <laughs> courageous never see themselves that way. Just know that you're in good company there. It I really a- thought I had that Hufflepuff energy. <laughs> You do have a lot of Hufflepuff energy, but there's a little <laughs> bit of Gryffindor in there too. Totally. Just a little bit. Yeah. I'm yeah. never long bottom. It's fine. <laughs> I'll be important like right at the end. <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think just like uh, most Gryffindors, you are important all the way through, even when you don't want to be. <sighs> <laughs> and I know that, that's harsh. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's not harsh. It's hard to live up to. I have noticed that, yeah. like, I'm not trying to brag about this or anything, but a lot of, like, TikTok fans, followers have been like, you're kind of a little bit of a hero. And I'm like, excuse me, what? I'm 5'4. I am good with words. That's that's my skill, buddy. <laughs> You are good with words. I think you're amazing with words. I think that's part of why you have such a following. Uh, I'm I'm trying. I will say that I'm thankful that the book has been doing so good as well as like reviews and people have been talking about. I got compared to George Orwell in an interview or in a review. George oh, Orwell. Cool. And I'm like, ha, 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 that went right to my head. Thanks. <laughs> that is hilarious it was like swinging wildly between imposter syndrome and god complex for like a week after that happened <laughs> that's pretty cool though that's pretty cool. right and, and you know you, you you mentioned that you're only five foot four you know yeah jo- joan of arc was only five foot two you know what you can Idol. be a powerful that's fine <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can be a powerhouse in a small package so who inspires you the most um that is a really hard question if you're talking about writing it's really a toss-up um m night Shyamalan is a really big inspiration uh john green steven shabatsky sarah dessin there's quite a few um but if we're talking like personally uh dolly parton is actually really far up there um Oh, man, I think she's just, like, a hero. Honestly, she does so much good with what she has for her platform. Um, It's really refreshing to see. Yeah. Yeah, she's been pretty cool. And she's done some some musical scores with some of the other uh, bands that my... uh, my best friend's daughter listens to she listens to a lot of christian music and she did a duet recently with the band called for king and country and oh my gosh that woman has still got the voice those pipes yeah. oh she's God. incredible <laughs> man and you went to college right uh no nope no i did several ap classes with college credit oh yeah but i yeah, didn't yeah, go yeah. to college that's what it was yeah so you had teachers in columbia yep and uh yeah and georgia when i went to school at liberty wow that's pretty cool i love that you were able to do that while you were still in I mean, that's me too um i did get to go back to columbia central recently and i visited some of my teachers that were still there and being able to hand my english teacher like the book that I wrote was uh, probably like a more proud moment than like when it was family. Even uh, I wish yes. my psychology teacher was still there, but she does know. And I have like talked to her since, but knowing that my teachers that also really did inspire a lot of this work um, are on board with this and proud of this and support. This means absolutely everything. I mean, they taught me everything I know and I couldn't be thank- like more thankful 
to grow up where I did and have the opportunities to be in these classes. That is so cool. Yeah, like having access to creative writing classes and psychology classes in high school, I wouldn't be like this if I didn't. That's freaking amazing. And I had a creative writing class that I absolutely loved when I was in high school. And that was such a a natural and and beautiful outlet for me. I learned so much about myself by going through those creative writing classes and being able to figure out how to put everything into words, all this stuff that I was feeling and experiencing. And then I was taken out of that class and put in an alternative school. And that's when things started going completely sideways and really bad for me. I have that creative outlet taken away, you know, more kids need these creative outlets. We keep on taking these creative writing and the art classes and all this stuff out of these schools. And we're leaving them with nothing but math and science, which most, most kids hate anyway, you know? Yeah. (laughs) So I love science, but math was never what I was good at. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was a big fan of history. Uh, I like history a lot. Yeah. Uh, I hated math. Uh, science was, I, I hated that until I had a really good teacher. And I think that has a lot to do with it too. You know, you get, you get the right teacher in front of the kids. Somebody has a passion for teaching this stuff and suddenly it becomes a whole new world. Yeah. My eighth grade science teacher made sure that I at least kind of care about science now to the point where, um, I do like a lot of stuff talking about 3d printing with a friend of mine. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. I love science when it comes to chemistry, uh, biology, engineering. I'm just not good enough at math to be good enough at science. Wow. That's, yeah, there's that's too much cool, math though. in science. Oh, my gosh. I know. I tried to take um, uh, chemistry at one point. It's like, nope, this is, this is a bad idea. <laughs> you mean math with letters. <laughs> that's right. Ugh. Yeah. I, I failed algebra, and I thought I was going to ace this. <laughs> this <is> stupid. <laughs> So when it, whenever you're, I know you've got um, uh, your own family life and stuff, and we're not going to get into too much of that, but if you were to have children that you were raising in today's society, mm-hmm. now, how would you encourage them to get into the arts? I mean, all this stuff's getting taken out of the schools. I actually took my kids out of the schools. Um, oh, after Look Nashville, I couldn't do it anymore. <sighs> that right after spring break, I just pulled my my oldest, but he really likes books. He really likes coloring. Uh, both of my kids, they love the masks. Uh, my daughter actually helped make her own. Aww. My two year old, um, yeah, she she's featured on my my TikTok sometimes. Oh, um, that's awesome! Yeah, that's, when people are looking for your TikTok videos, where do they go? uh mason carlisle tiktok or mason carlisle author on tiktok nice okay yeah i I believe i'm already following you on tiktok but if i'm not i'm about to (laughs) Ooh, but yeah my son he loves to color uh my daughter too um they both like to paint uh my daughter's really into music like really into music so i don't think that they'll have a huge problem with staying involved in art I mean, seriously, you're not going to get another generation of musicians and artists and singers and actors and writers if you're not encouraging the arts. That's very true. We actually have been hanging out with my parents more. Um, My dad had a recent health issue come up in November, and it kind of brought that family together. But he ended up getting quads, and now both my kids, like, ride around on quads, and they're getting (laughs) chickens to hatch and grow out there for 4-H at some point. Oh, that's so cool. Yep. That's awesome. Now, that's some hands-on learning. There's been this huge uptick lately in doing the the outside learning experiences like that, like mm-hmm. raising animals and doing hikes and going on nature explorations and learning about plants. And kids, for whatever reason, are absolutely drawn to this learning style. It's, it's all hands-on. It's they can they can tangibly feel the leaves of the trees they can touch the grass they can play with the animals and it's they're they're absorbing the information faster you know 
I, I don't know how we can incorporate math into this other than to count the chickens' eggs, but you don't want to count, count them before they're hatched, they always say. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to incorporate schooling into pretty much everything I do. Like cooking, you can teach a lot of math and science, like, you know, playing with the kitties, uh, brushing them, laser lights. Uh, we played with a lot with the laser lights and the cats. Uh, yeah, they basically love having fun with the animals, too, and I try to incorporate, like, science and learning into that when I can. Oh, that's awesome. I always get asked, like, why don't you go back to college? I'm like, because I don't even want a degree in anything. I just want to learn what would even be the point, because I just stay in college <laughs> until I got bored and switched to the next subject, and then I'd never have money. <laughs> a lifetime student. Yeah, I'd be a lifetime student. I just love learning. Like, off the top of my head, I'd want to get into English. I'd obviously want to be into psychology. Um, I'd also like to do philosophy. Yeah, it just goes on and on. Like, that that's a dangerous place to have access to all that material. And it costs thousands of dollars. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes, absolutely. And people didn't understand me when I would do this as a kid. It's like, well, I wanted to learn. I wanted to know more about it. And nobody would really answer all of my but why questions yeah the same oh. I, I was also a why child uh my yeah. daughter has entered that phase already <laughs> like she's two and she's asking me like what doing and I'll tell her and she'll be like why and I'm like oh dear god um <laughs> <laughs> here we go <laughs> yep it's starting but that inquisitive mind man it'd be silenced in a school yep and I love answering their questions. Uh, the other day, my, my son asked me if sharks were real. And I'm like, yep, sharks are real. They live in oceans. We live by lakes, though. So there's not going to be any sharks where we live. And he's <laughs> like, oh, okay. Are alligators real? And Aww. I'm like, they are. He's like, where do they live? Florida? He's like, what do people who live in Florida look like? And I'm like, oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pull up a few news. And then a million headlines <laughs> flash like, in my head. And I'm like, oh, just people like us, honey. Oh, that's hilarious. He pictured oh it is so far away. We're in Michigan for reference, but he pictured Florida as like some far off land. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, kind of. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're going by foot. Mason, where do people go when they want to grab your books? Uh, Amazon or Etsy's going to have them signed and uh, stickers and bookmarks added. But. If you want to just pick up a copy of The Ghost of You or Deterrent My Way, head over to Amazon and look up either Mason Carlisle or The Ghost of You and you'll find the series. Very cool. And you've got your own website. And uh, I'll make sure that I put all these links and stuff in the description of the podcast so that it's easy for people to find so they can follow you on TikTok. That would be uh, they awesome. They can find your website. Yeah. All the important stuff, right? Like I said, I absolutely love being able to catch up with you and, and have our chat. And you're going to reach out to me next time you have another one coming out, right? I actually do have another one coming out this fall. Oh, so I'm going to have you on the show again. I cannot <laughs> wait. All right, Mason. Thank you so much. I love what thank you're you. doing. Keep doing it. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I love your show, and I love what you do, and I love the things that you spread awareness to. So thank you for Aww. having me, and thank you for creating this platform in the first place. Awesome. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Thank you. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you're going to find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune into my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com.